Very warm greetings to all in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Before we go further, let us all turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for journey mercies to thy house. Thank you especially for this great privilege to be found in the house of prayer tonight, that we can seek thy face, to ask for your help for thy church, for thy kingdom's work, and for one another to live godly lives for you. And Lord, we come at this time seeking again for the cleansing and washing thoroughly of all our sins. And Lord, we do pray that you remove all the tiredness of the body, the distractions of the day, and cast our hearts and minds upon thy word. And Father, we pray that you grant to our hearts understanding, grant to our hearts convictions, Lord, that we may live as we ought to in these perilous times. Be with us tonight, we pray, and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let us remember, by doing some revision, we are studying about despisers of those that are good. Despisers of those that are good. Um, all right, let's try Enoch. What are despisers of those that are good? What does it mean? All right, try the sister, Anna. Don't you remember? We studied the whole lesson last week. Um, all right, try Benedict. What are despisers of those that are good? What does it mean? Oh, maybe I should preach last week's message again. All right, last. Um, Alex. All right, very good. Something that is good, but they see it as evil. We even read some verses. You come in the days where people who call good evil and evil good, right? That's an example. Now, we have to know this meaning because God says, and I hope that those who have not remembered it, God says, we in the church will be in danger of being despisers of those that are good. And if you and I do not know the meaning of it, then we can be despisers of the good one day or even now and not realize that we are in the very category that God has pulled out, put in His eternal word to warn us not to be despisers of those that are good. All right? So, despisers of those that are good. Now, try to take some notes because as you write, it helps you to remember. It means people who have no love for good. I explained last week, it's made of just one Greek word, although we take a few English words, I think six English words, to describe one Greek word. It means ah. All right, R means no, and mix up of another word, phileo means love, you know the word. R means no, phileo means love, and agathos, which is good, all right? So this word together in one Greek word means no love for good. It means, well, as you look at the word, remember a few things, okay, because tonight we want to Learn about the progression, the progression and the prevention from becoming such people, all right? The progression and the prevention, but first remember what it means. Now, it means there's no love for good people or good things. Those, those can be those people, can be those good things. Now, what is good? We know that it is not the definition of what the world says something is good. It is purely what God says is good. What God commands, what God commands is good. So whatever is in Scripture that God commands us to love, to desire, that is good. Okay, so remember that. Do not let the world influence your idea of good. Now, 
despisers of good means those who look down on something or someone. You despise something means you look down, right? You look down on something. Now, it means to have little or no respect for something or someone. So it's quite straightforward, right? Despise. Um, and when we are like that, we have a low opinion and a low regard. Low opinion and low regard. Now, I want you to remember all these meanings in scriptures because we will begin to see that we are actually like that in many areas. All right? Have a low opinion of or low regard and see as little or no worth. Why do you despise something or someone? You see them as having little worth or no worth at all. So you despise it, right? And now, with all that, ultimately, we see something as negligible. Hmm? Negligible and we will neglect it. Despising leads to that. See something as no worth, no respect for it, look down on it. Eventually, you will find that, well, it's negligible, not to be taken note of, and you will neglect it. So God says, when it comes to good, the Christian can be like that. Last week, we saw that how the world will despise us for obedience to God. Now, this week, we want to, and we saw some, of, some examples of how we ourselves can despise good, but how does it get to that stage? Now, let's turn to our Bibles, all right? Turn to our memory verse, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. The progression. Now, I'm not going to trace the progression here. I'm going to discuss another passage of scriptures. But what we want to realize in verses um, 2 and 3 is God describing the characteristics of Christians. It means you and I, we are in danger of these things. And many of them, we, as we've studied in the last couple of months, we can trace how one characteristic leads to another in this sequence. Which means the Christian must realize the way God has described these characteristics, within it is a warning that we grow into these things. All right? So, you and I must not think that, well, I'm not a despiser of good things. I come for prayer meetings, right? That's why I'm here. I attend Bible studies. I take FEBC courses. I'm serving. I'm not despisers of good things. Well, the thing is this. We progress to that state. God is not talking to Christians to say simply that, well, you know, we, we are like that, but we can progress into that state. So much so that he says, well, from such turn away, from such turn away. When you see someone has become like that, turn away from them, have no fellowship with them. That is how serious it is. When God says from such turn away, the warning is we can become one day such people to the point where God says we have become despisers of good and Christians should not fellowship with us. So I'm I'm not the one who says from such turn away. You see, it sounds very unloving. Why would God even say from having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away? Because it's contagious. We can become despisers of those that are good as well. Is God a God of love? Absolutely. But God is a God of truth. And truth to God well, true love is always in truth. God tells us to avoid becoming such people, to avoid such people because of his love for you. Now, how does it progress? Well, there are many passages in scriptures that we can learn from, but tonight I want us to draw from Genesis 25. Can you please turn to Genesis 25? Genesis 25. All right, for those who do not remember what is good, 
Next week, I will ask again. Enoch, all right? So that you remember. It is very important so that we don't become people like that without realizing. Now, Genesis 25 I want us to read together aloud um, from verses um, 27, all right, 27 to 34, 27 to 34, reading, and the boys grew, and Esau was cunning, was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man, dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau, because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And Jacob sought pottage, and Esau came from the field and was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall, it, shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink, and rose up, and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now here we have God saying that Esau despised his birthright. And I want to draw lessons from here. We know this story very well. How does one progress from, well, having something that is precious and end up despising it. Because God is talking to Christians. Christians in church, Christians in our life. We have wonderful treasures. But God says we can be despisers of good. Like Esau despised something that was so wonderful, his birthright. Now we know Esau was the firstborn of Isaac and Rebekah, an heir of the promise. And Esau should have clung to his birthright. Now, the birthright of the eldest male in the um, ancient Near East tradition would confer to the oldest the headship of the clan, right? You know that. So they will become head of the clan and also double share of inheritance. So the birthright was very precious. Now, imagine... Jacob, who took over the birthright. And then from there on, Israel was formed because of that, right? The birthright of Israel. That is infinite privilege that through that, the Savior would come, Savior of the world would come, would be the witness for the Lord in the world in the Old Testament days. But what did he trade it for? What did he trade it for? A bowl of stew, right? A bowl of stew. The most wonderful promises made. Now, Esau would have known, all right? These people in those days, when it comes to birthrights, they are very, very um, important. They are very much treasured. So much so that Jacob wanted it, right? So Esau would not have been ignorant of that great good that he had. Now, in fact, if you look at chapter 25, verse 12, and Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. So the birthright that came from Isaac to, to um, Esau would be Abraham's um, inheritance. So Esau would have known all this, the inheritance of Abraham, but, but yet... But yet, what did God say? Esau despised his birthright. How did he come to this stage? What can we learn before we also be despisers of that which is good? 
Now, if you trace, by the time he was famished, all right, he was in the field. Um, well, no, look at verse 29 first, all right? Look, look at verse, sorry, verse 28. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So Esau seems to be someone that is a good cook, a good cook, all right? Someone who loved food. And his venison was so good that his dad loved him. <laughs> you know, you, you love your son, and because your son is so good in something, you love him even more. Because of his, of his um, particular skill or his own love for food, usually people who love food are good cooks, right? So I guess we can draw from that. He loved food and he, he probably dabbled with it a fair bit. Hmm? Probably honed his skills to the point where it was so special, his venison was so special. Now then he, if you look at verse, um, verse 29, well, he came in from the field and was faint. Faint means he was famished, very tired and very, very hungry, all right? Weak. And in verse 31, uh, verse 30, he said, feed me. So what he wanted was food. Feed me, I pray thee, with the same red pottage. Now, at this point, Jacob, who knew how precious birthright are, how good it is, would make a deal, would make a deal. Now, the progression stemmed first from a person who has something in our lives that we, well, we dabble in, we like, we are good at. Um, and then eventually, it will come by the time, I would say by the time, by the time we reach a situation, he reached a situation where he was in great difficulty, right? In great difficulties, and he wanted something very much, very, very much. I don't think he was at the point of death, right? Because he would say, oh, I'm already going to die. You know, what, what's the use of the birthright? Because, well, the Bible says, well, swear to, Jacob says, swear to me, sell me your birthright. Then Jacob gave him bread and pottage, and he ate, and he got up, and he went out. All right? If someone is, is, has been starving in the wilderness to the point of death, I don't think he would recover so quickly. It still takes time. All right? So he just eat, strengthen, and walk out. So three things we want to learn from the progression. The first, there are things in our life that may not be sinful. All right? May not be sinful. Nothing wrong with, with, with uh, eating, nothing wrong with being good at something, nothing wrong. But they can be things that when we reach a stage, and this is a second, <clears throat> when we reach a stage where <clears throat> we are in dire situation and we long for something, now those things that may at one point of time be nothing very um, sinful, food, but can become something so um, overwhelmingly important to us that we would want it more than that which is spiritually, infinitely better. That is the second thing. That is how it progresses, how it progresses. Right? Then thirdly, the third stage, then it will come to that point where we would readily give up. In fact, we would say, what's the point of this? No point. Look, I'm in trouble. These things that God has given to me that is so wonderful, it's no use to me, can't help me in what I want. Then we will despise it. We will readily trade it off because we despise it. Now that is why I say we must remember the meaning of the word. Because he looked down on it. Compared to food and what God gives as good, he looked down on what God gives as good. 
he had a low opinion. Remember these words. Between the portage and the birthright, unlike Jacob, Jacob was very, very conscious of the, and he had a very, very high opinion of the birthright, but not Esau. He had very little regard for it. Remember the words? He did not see that it was worth much at that point. Not worth much. When it was so wonderful, the, the passing down of the birthright from Abraham to Isaac to him, but little worth, little worth. The good things that God gives as spiritual, we see them as little worth. Then it finally, I mentioned the words, it's negligible. It's nothing compared to what I want. What I want is food, I'm, and I'm going to die. What is it? It's, n it's nothing. And finally, neglects it. Throws it off. Neglect it. Forget about it. So, initially, I would not say that, at least trying to imagine in those days, having that birthright, I won't say that, I, I can't imagine that um, Esau completely thought it was worthless, all right? But it is only when he was in this stage, reached this time in his experience in life, that he says, well, what's the point? I despise it, despise it. Now, what must you learn? Now, Christians, how do we come to a point where we will despise the good things that God gives to us in church? In your life, for example, God gave us His Holy Word. In it resides the counsel of the Great Counselor. We just learned about Christ the Great Counselor. Within it is knowledge infinite. God gave us His Holy Word to guide us to anything in our life. It's the greatest treasure. God gave us His Holy Word that we may know the living God, come to know who the living God is, His characteristics. That is what the, God, the Word of God is. When you first got saved, I hope it was so, you remember how you treasured reading the Bible? It's almost like you have to force yourself to, to go to work, force yourself to put studies aside. You just keep wanting to read it. You treasured it once. You cherished it once. Now, how, has it, how is it that it has reached a stage that you and I today find Bible reading a chore? What about prayer? The good thing that God gave to us, the place of prayer, at home, you can approach the throne of the living God without fear, freely. Have the year of the year of the living God. This wonderful, good privilege. How does it how has it reached a point where praying is a mere duty? And we can't wait for it to be over. And going to the house of prayer is something that we drag our feet to. How does we how did we reach that stage? Now, so Christians, we cannot say that we are not in that category despisers of those that are good. These are all the good things God gives to us in our lives. How, have, how do we reach a stage where coming to church to study His Word, to have this freedom where in other countries they have to, well, hide, to meet, to study God's Word. Do we treasure it? Do we love it? No, it is actually something of a pain to many. We can't say that we are not despisers of this wonderful good privilege that God has given us. What about family worship? Family worship. In the past, you can't wait for family worship time to, to begin. But what has happened? Now it's, oh no, it's family worship time. All right? That has to um, cajole back and finally have to be very stern before you sit down for family worship but family worship is a time of great 
it's a great gift from God that we can study the Word together, pray together, approach the throne of God together as a family. What happened to um, the desire to study God's Word? We have FEBC courses, so inexpensive, so readily available. Such good things, live streaming that we have when you travel. Do you find that, well, live streaming is something we, we better do, better submit for live streaming? Um, but it's not something that you look forward to. A good thing that even when you are away, you are in Margaret River or whatever river at night, right? That you can actually still access the study of the Word of God. It's there. How has it come to a point where we see them as not something that is valuable, not worth our time, negligible, and we end up neglecting it? All these things, many more. So God has given us many good things, but we actually despise them. How? Well, let's begin by learning then how to um, avoid this progression. It is a progression. Please remember, all right? It is a progression, and as you acknowledge, you know in your heart, you used to love to pray, you used to love to read the Bible, you used, used to love to study the Word, you used to love many things, good things, spiritual things. You love to obey many things. But now it is no longer so. How do you progress to that? How to avoid it? Well, the first thing, the first thing, that we learned in Esau's case also is treasure, all right? Treasure and cherish the good things that God has given to us. Treasure it. The whole point about despise is basically you look down on it, all right? You have a low opinion of it. You don't respect it. Esau progressed to this stage not overnight. He had good things in his life, many good things. So Christian, when we begin to know that something is drawing our hearts away from our closeness with the Lord, our walk with Him, when it's time to do your quiet time, when it's time to pray, when it's time to um, go to church, to fellowship and all, you find that you're, you're unwilling. You have to ask, what is that thing that now has become a normal thing in life, like food, like studies, like your job, like your family, like certain duties in life? How has it become something that has overtaken you? You have to ask yourself and begin to now say, I must treasure these good things that God has freely given into my life, more, more than venison, right? Than sleep, than studies, than um, doing my work over time. Treasure means you desire it above all. That is what it means. So Christian, you want to avoid the progression to this? All the things that I've mentioned just now and whatever else that God brings to your heart about spiritual good that He has readily made available for our life, for our spiritual good. Treasure it. Look upon it as something that is so worthy of your high respect. Don't look at coming to church as something that is, well, a left, if you have left over time, I will go. Look at everything that God um, gives as benefits, spiritual benefits in your life. The quiet time, the Lord's day. God said, keep. Keep the Sabbath holy. Keep means guard. You know this very well. Guard it like it is a treasure. That is what the word means. Guard it like a treasure. Don't, so much so that you do not want anything to steal it away from you. So treasure the Lord's day. If you're not treasuring it, then you know you are on the path. You are on the path 
to being despisers of good things, if not already a despiser of good things. Now, the Lord's Day is something that God gave to men to cherish, a day to be with Him, a day to um, uh, know Him, a day to serve Him, a day to rest from the toils of the world. In those days, the other religions, they marveled, all right? They were shocked when they saw the children of Israel have one day in seven to draw close to their God, to receive word from their God, to pray, to worship the, their God. They could not understand because they only would meet their God once a year, twice a year, special occasion, then they go and sacrifice and hope they didn't do anything wrong that one time, otherwise they'll be cursed. So when they saw the children of Israel have the Sabbath, they marveled at it and said, Whoa. and they literally said, what God is it that is so close to his people? Our God is not interested in us. Our God will meet us maybe once a year and we better get it right and if we do something wrong, he will, he will kill us. What kind of God is this? So the children of Israel, when they broke the Sabbath again and again, they despised, they despised the Lord's day. So Christian, if you are someone that continues to say, oh, what's the point, you know, and all, well, then you have become a despiser of something so wonderful. Now then, the second thing is this. Now, before we go there, yeah, I want to say this. Like, like Esau, like Esau, something that is normal, that is good, because now that has become a treasure of your heart or it has become something more important than the good things that God has given to you, the spiritual things. When it comes a point of time where you are in great trouble, great need, now, then it comes to the second thing that we must learn to, in order to prevent the progression, prevent this, all right? To prevent this. Now, that is to have genuine, to have true convictions about good things. Not just treasure. Not just know that it is good. Like I said earlier, it is a common, a very, very common and a very important um, thing for the, for the people to have birthright, all right? So it's not something that, that I think Esau completely did not treasure by the, by the understanding of how the ancients lived. But when he came to a stage where he was famished, now did he really, well, maybe at some point he treasured, but did he really, really have that conviction that this is so precious, this is so good that I'd rather die than to give it up. You will only be like that when the world offers you this thing that you want, that you desire so much, more than you treasure more than what your genuine convictions are about what you treasure about spiritual things. The world will one day offer something to you to ask you, will you sell? Will you sell your soul, right? Sell your, your birthright to have this thing? Will you or not? That is what Jacob was trying to entice Esau with. Sell it to me. Jacob knew exactly when all right, exactly when to get it. Satan knows that. All right? I'm not saying Esau, uh, Jacob is Satan, all right? But well, Satan knows the desires of our heart. He will aim, he will time. It is at the point where we are weakest. Unless we have strong convictions, we will become despisers of good. Now, remember I said despise so please remember this word. I'm going to ask next week, all right? Randomly, as well as those who forgot. Despise literally means a, no, phileo, love, agathos, good. No love for good, all right? No love for good. 
there is this important understanding that we must have. It is no, not good enough, all right? Not good enough to be neutral. We must have love for good. To avoid being despisers of that which is good, to avoid that progression, I hope you and I remember this. It is not good enough for us to be neutral about these spiritual things. We must have a love for it because despises means no love. In order to avoid this progression, we must have love for good. That is the key thing that we must remember. If Esau had love for his birthright, then even when he was at that stage and Jacob said, you sell me your birthright for this pottage, if he had love for his birthright, even in the worst situation, he would say, no way, no way. No way at all, Jacob. Now, it means this, Christian. If you are someone who finds coming to church neutral, teens, I go to church because daddy and mommy wants me to go, so I go. Now, it will start off with just neutral. I, I'm not against it. I'm not crazy or worried, but I'll just go. You do not have a love for the good things that God provides for you, church, fellowship, learning the word, praying, having a covenantal family. If you do not have active love for it, when the time comes, teens, you will start to grow. Your friends will introduce things to you. May not be sinful things. The world will dangle things to you. You will participate in activities, may not be sinful, maybe just sports, whatever it is. But it will come a point of time that, well, you need to have it for whatever reason. Unless you love spiritual things. When the teacher said, you must come for this, and it's something that is, you know that Christians should not be part of, unless you really love, love, good. You say, I'd rather not go to church. I'd rather go for these things. I'd rather not um, um, take FEBC courses. I'd rather not focus on my final year and do very, very well. I'd rather not because this is final year. You see, unless you have an active love, well, adults likewise. If you find, well, coming to church, learning the word, at home conducting family worship, or singles, your quiet time, your prayer time, you're taking, um, studying the Word of God. When you don't have an active love for it, when you're on holiday, ooh, you know, I spend so much money. Why do I want to live stream? I want to watch TV. I want to, I want to relax. I want to sleep. I want to go out and enjoy this and that. When it comes to the time, because of what you fail to have genuine treasure for, you will trade it off. You will despise the avenues of learning, of fellowshipping. The avenues are there. Now, if you find that studying the Word on your own, if you find that coming to church where God says he gives pastors and teachers to feed you, if you find it coming to the house of prayer where Christ was so angry at them for turning the house of God, the house of prayer, into a den of trading and, and so on, if Christ calls the house of God the house of prayer, that is something that God is saying, this is so precious to my people. How dare you turn it into a house of, of whatever you want to turn it into? But if you see coming to the house of prayer as something optional, um, that you can, well, initially you say, well, if I can come, I can, if I have time, I'll come. But over time, or even studying the word or fellowship, I have time, I'll come, don't worry, you're neutral. You're neutral at best. Then when the time comes that whether it's work, whether it's something in life, some commitment, some family issues and all that, 
you will reach a stage where you say, oh, yeah, it can be neglected. It can be neglected. So remember what is despises of good? You find that it's something that you can neglect because you do not have a love for that which God calls good. So Christians, please remember that. It's a progression that God says all of us can fall into. Hence, he put it in his word. Don't be despisers of those things that are good. The many, many avenues of learning, growing, fellowshipping, encouraging one another, be an encourager, areas of service. I give you so much good things that, can, that will eventually turn to your eternal good. But because you have a low opinion of that, you will eventually say, I can neglect it and it's fine. That is what it is. How did your family worship progress to no family worship? Now, when it comes to this, it means, it means this. Do not just have outward conformity. Do not just have outward conformity. I come because I have to come, so I come. I need to behave this way. I need to make decisions like that. And therefore, I do it. Because, well, I need to do it because outwardly that's what I'm expected to do. Now, I want to clarify. I am not saying that if you don't feel like doing what is good, treasuring what, is, what God gives you as good, then don't do it. Don't conform. I'm not saying that. Don't misunderstand it. There's a group of Christians that believe that. If you don't feel like it and you do it, then it is sin. No, God says, you obey my commandments whether you love it or you do not love it. All right? It is our duty to obey. But this duty must always be out of... You must build. Rather, I say this. You must build your duty to perform. You must build your duty to love out of convictions out of a love for God. It must be that. Because outward conformity will not last very long, my dear friends. And teens, I want to warn you of that. If you do not have phileo for good things, love for the good things in your life, your parents are good. They love you. They want you to be spiritual. They persuade you to go to church. They bring you to church. Don't despise them. Don't despise the good that God put in your life. Good spiritual parents that want you to sit down, have family worship. I will teach you God's word. We will pray together. Don't despise that. Because if you don't have a love for it, teens, when you grow, up, grow further and, you're, and you, you feel that, well, I don't need my mommy and daddy anymore, right? I can live on my own. You're gonna, you can't wait to be freed of this. Now, many Christians, when they are in church, they come for everything. You can't even differentiate them from, from, um, from those that do not love God. Very zealous and all. But the moment they are on holiday, or the moment they are sent overseas to study, that is the test. If you, even for adults, all the while are you just conforming outwardly? Do you have genuine convictions and treasure for the good things that God put in your life? If you don't, That will come up the moment you have freedom. The moment you see no one will watch. The moment you're in difficulties, you will despise the good things that God gave to you. You will say, I'll throw this all away and I'll go all the way to get what I want, to do what I want. Well, you must have real love for good things. Biblical separation is often viewed as an as a evil thing. Christians are antagonistic towards those that practice biblical separation, right? But it is in the Word of God, come out from among them, touch not their unclean things. Because your friendship with the world is enmity with God. We are not saying you don't have friends. You, we are not saying that you don't do anything in this world. But if you find that having Christian friends, being part of Christian friendship, is not as nice, not as fun as friendship with unbelievers, but you still come. You still do the things that you need to do. And you don't want to give up what, God, what you know God says is good. Come out from among them. God says friendship, friendship, friendship with the world is enmity with God. 
it will come a point of time you say, enough already. I'm sick of it. I'm leaving. Because you, you, you will reach that outward, very, very overt kind of despising. We have people who have been through churches. I've seen that in other churches, in our church. Very, very zealous and all that. But it was not genuine. In the heart, they, they actually love the opposite things. But they just keep doing it. Now, in other words, my point is this. Christians, if you know anything in your heart, that you know the Word of God says, this is good. But I also like the other thing. You must solve it now. You must deal with it. How? You must deal with it and say, I do not have a love for the good that God say, speaks about. I am at best neutral about it. I will go along with it, but I do not have a love for it. I must have a love for it. Because despisers are people who do not have a love for good. If I don't have a love for, for this good, then I am classified under this perilous characteristic of the end times Christian. I do not have a love. So Christian, we must, we must love that which is good. Now you know well what the Lord told the disciples, Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and, what does he say? And despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You will come out to work soon. If you do not develop a love for the good things, spiritual things, when you come out to work, mammon will call to you. Mammon, money, possessions. Um, it will call to you. And it is not my words, not the words of a preacher. It's the words of the living God that says you cannot serve two masters. In other words, you cannot love two masters at one time. In fact, God put it this way, you will hate the one and love the other. Me hate God. No, how can you say that I despise good things? How can you say that I hate God? God says that. And He says you will hold to the one and despise the other. Which one will it be for you and I? Which one? Hold to one, despise the other. You will only hold to that which you really see in your heart is good. That is what it is. And you despise the other one which God calls is good? Which one? Now, Christian, how... I want to say again, outward conformity will only last so long. If, if you are just merely outward conforming, you are in a great danger. You must develop love. You pray, Lord, I do not love the good things that you've put in my life. The Word of God, the, the avenues to study, its Word, prayer, having a church to come to study and to fellowship and to serve in. I, I do not love it. I'm just going along as expected. That is all. Lord, help me to love these things because I do not want to one day trade it off. And you will. How long? When? No one knows. But know this. God says there are such Christians in the church. It means it will happen. So Christians, I hope that we remember treasure, number one. But let that treasure be a genuine treasure. And if you don't have it, that genuine love for good things, you must deal with it. Don't just continue to go along. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for giving us your holy word in scriptures that we may know the dangers of the times that we live in. Father, we have to acknowledge that we often do not love the good things that you give to us, the spiritual benefits. We are at best cold. We are at best Lord, um, neutral, but Lord, we know that eventually one day we will despise these things and hold on to the other things that we consider as good. Lord, you do not want us to be lukewarm. We must either be hot or cold, useful, having a zeal one way or the other. Lord, we pray that you would deal with us, show us areas where we are just outwardly conforming, Lord, we need to deal with it.
Father, we pray that you will meet with us in the place of prayer. We are hopeless and helpless without your hearing our cries tonight and to help your church and to help thy people to live on earth for your glory. We ask and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.